Welcome everyone. We are so excited to be with you again. It's almost amazing to understand that this is our third annual conference that we're celebrating. So we are very excited to be with you. Our conference today is focused on the maternal gift economy as a deep alternative to patriarchal capitalism and more. We're very excited and honored to have with us Genevieve Vaughn, Heidi Gutner Abendroth, Mig Mahan, Darsha Navarez, Mary Condren, and Susan Petrilli. We'll have brief introductions for the extended versions of each of our presenters bios. Please do take a look at our website. I would like to introduce our first speaker, Genevieve Vaughn. She's an independent researcher who lives part-time in Italy and part-time in Texas. She created a multicultural all-woman activist foundation that ran from 1987 to 2005 called the Compassionate Society. She's the founding mother of the Temple of Sekhmet in the Nevada desert that was created in 1992. And she co-created the Network of International Feminists for a Gift Economy. Her foundational book, Forgiving, has changed many people's minds. So please take a look at our website for a full bio for Jen. And for now, welcome, Jen. Thank you. Thank you so much, Letitia. And thank you, everybody, for coming. Um, I'm going to use a PowerPoint. The maternal gift economy as the alternative to patriarchal capitalism. This is the name of my, my talk. And I do believe that it is. If I can actually explain it well enough to show it, I'm not sure. But I keep on trying um, with change. Okay. Um, I recently went to a conference in Berlin of the Kurdish women, and um, I'm dedicating this presentation to them. They are trying to create a new society and uh, in their homeland, Rojava, which is now being attacked by Turkey again. And uh, they have had to defend themselves against these attacks again and again so in, because Kurdistan uh, really doesn't have its uh, a territory, an autonomous territory outside of other countries. Um, and so the other countries want to take over and occupy it and possess it. And so, um, Turkey is one of those, and it's doing it now, and very pretty terrible bombings are happening. So their their um, slogan or uh, uh, cry is Jin Jan Adzadi, which means women, life, and freedom. And that, that slogan is now going everywhere. Even the women in Iran are, are using it and so on. So that, I think, is important. Um, can you change the slide, please? Okay. So this came from their program of the Women's Conference in Berlin. What does it mean to create intellectual power independent of the male-dominated system's thought structures to defeat the system in the mental realm? And I think that is really a very important question, because if we don't defeat the system in the mental realm, we keep repeating it. We keep going back to the same things. So until we know exactly what it is that di differentiates a better world and a better way of thinking uh, from what we have now in the male-dominated system, uh, we are, we, it will be much, much more difficult to create an alternative a living way. Uh, so please change. 
and this goes on with what they said uh, in the uh, in the program have the intellectual and theoretical criticisms and rejections developed by women against the patriarchal system managed to not reproduce the system why is it important to develop an alternative paradigm what role does ideology play in women's struggles change please an opposition devoid of any ideological basis risks draining women's struggles of their essence and assimilating them into the system. Is it possible for women to create an inclusive and holistic ideological outlook in opposition to the intertwined policies and ideological assaults of male domination? Change, please. Okay. Um, in order, it, and this is now the beginning of my own uh, talk, in order to become independent of the patriarchal thought structures in our society, we have to be very radical. And the word radical comes from the Latin radix root. We have to get to the root, to, to the time and place prior to those structures, to prehistory matriarchal and gatherer-hunter societies past and present, and to the prehistory in the present, to the matricentric period of every life that goes from conception to three or four years of age, and continues in the meaningful underground patterns of throughout maturity, even in patriarchal capitalism. These underground patterns are originally the giving and receiving integrated material, emotional thought structures of the maternal gift economy. They are integrated because in the early years, children have not begun to abstract and separate the material from the emotional or thinking from doing. And the motherers attuned to this integration, even if they are uh, have begun to abstract as they have gotten older. Let me change. Um, children live in an economy that is free to them, and it is only later when they encounter the quid pro quo economy and logic that children begin to disintegrate. This makes it difficult for adults who have already separated abstract from concrete and exchange from gifting to understand the model of the unilateral maternal economy, even when they are practicing it themselves. Change, please. Moreover, the thought structures of the maternal economy have not been visible to patriarchal investigation because the investigators were all men who after childhood did not take part in the maternal economy. Even now, the many women in academia do not have time to do much direct mothering, and the context of ideas in which they work is formed of centuries of exclusion of the mother-child experience, as well as the fragmentation of knowledge into the silos of different disciplines. This has the effect that even when childhood is the focus of an academic discipline, the, mo the model of the maternal gift economy is not visible. In a parallel way, the silos divide the study of even such breakthrough disciplines as interpersonal neurobiology of the child and the adult from issues of critical economics. So it's, uh, it's not seen as economic, the, the giving and receiving. All this has had the effect that the original human economic model has not been theorized as such. This invisibility of the maternal gift economy model has skewed the understanding of economics away from the purpose of satisfying human and environmental needs and has allowed instead the creation of a pr and promotion of a blindly self-serving mechanism that deprives the whole for the benefit of a minority and creates the pernicious stratospheric privileging of the few. Change, please. The problem is that the interaction of exchange itself, the principal 
interaction of the market directly contradicts the other oriented logic of the need satisfying gift. Quid pro quo, giving in order to receive, cancels and overshadows the direct other oriented need satisfying gift. Free giving and receiving is as economic as market exchange is. Free is a mode of production and distribution that is even more widespread than production for the market and distribution through exchange for money. This free economy is necessary as the form of mothering everywhere because young children cannot give back an equal return. Naming free maternal giving and receiving as an economy reduces the hegemony of the market economy over the semantic field of the word economy, allowing us to see that the gift coexists with exchange and indeed that the market economy is nurtured by the gift economy. <clears throat> the maternal gift economy is not restricted to childcare or to women only. Women's free labor in the home is given to the workers she has nurtured and including when the worker is herself, passes into the surplus value, the portion of the value of the labor time that is not paid for in the salary. The surplus value is given free to the capitalist who takes it as a gift and calls it profit. To this, we can add the free and low cost gifts of nature as well as those of culture and technological improvements that lower the cost of production and increase the profit mar margin. Profit, the motivation of the whole system, is made up of many gifts that are unrecognized as such because they are called by other names, like income, earnings, proceeds, revenue, interest, etc. The maternal gift economy nurtures the exchange economy which takes from it without recognizing it. For example, in 2012, using time use criteria, feminist economists estimated the USA's 2011 gross household product at $11.6 trillion as compared to a GDP of $13.3 trillion. So almost the same amount almost as much, the gross household product was almost as much worth almost as much as the GDP. If we add to this free production, the global ecosystem services, which have been estimated at some 125 trillion a year compared to the monetized economy's 75 trillion GDP, we can see how the market economy is like an island nurtured by a sea of unseen gifts. Change, please. That's what it looks like. Change, please. Not recognizing the gift aspect of profit is useful or even necessary for the market, capitalism and capitalists, to maintain an abundant flow of gifts upwards away from the needs of the many and toward the formation of ever greater accumulations of gifts as capital. Since women are the main caregivers of children in our society and thus practicers of the maternal gift economy, it is important for capitalism that we and the gift economy not be recognized. And this is another main reason for misogyny. Independently of gender, racial, ethnic, and national groups are also placed in a gift-giving role towards the structurally privileged groups who take their gifts from them. And this is one main reason for racism, classism, and even for the nationalism of colonialist countries. The gifts of the earth have also been invisible as such to our patriarchal capitalist culture and mindset. Considering the earth as only matter <clears throat> and not matter does not uh, allow us 
to receive from her with the gratitude that is part of knowing. Rather, it has allowed us to rape and plunder her, destroying the abundance of interconnecting, life-nurturing ecological niches provided by millennia of evolution for other creatures and ourselves. Many people believe that the values we human ha humans have in our culture need to change. But where do the values come from? Um, and here I want to use the Marxian idea of economic structure and ideological superstructure because it can be very useful in separating the thought structures of the patriarchal system from the gift paradigm. We can look at the maternal gift economy as an economic structure, which would then have an ideological superstructure. That it is, it has a logic and values that are in continuity and correspondence with the free work of child re rearing and the care of the home, the economia. This would be a superstructure of caring, life-oriented values typical of those who do that kind of work and of the infants and children and other adults who are its recipients. So the gift economy itself would, would bring about the values, superstructural values of care. But this life-tending economy is presently burdened by the existence of the patriarchal capitalist exchange economy, which draws its nurturance profit from the free gifts of women, workers, and nature. Thus, the total economic structure is actually formed of the two economies together and their interrelation. The values that arrive from, arise from the structure are often in conflict with each other, and they create a complex weave. The, the superstructure of the two economies together is therefore difficult to disentangle. As I said, it behooves patriarchy not to recognize the existence of the gift economy and its values so that it can better receive and plunder the gifts and dominate the givers. The patriarchal capitalist economy has brought many life improving developments, but it is like a Trojan horse, the wooden horse that seemed to be a gift but contained enemy warriors who plundered the city of Troy. To understand the complexity of this, these relations, it behooves us to look at gifting as primary and exchange as only one of its many variations. Both women and men actually participate in both economies as children and as adults in, no, in a number of ways. However, gifting is the basic human economy, while exchange is its derivative, a gift not given, but made contingent on a return. The logic of exchange is ego-oriented. The transaction is made to satisfy the need of the giver, so-called giver, while the gift is other-oriented, given to satisfy the need of the receiver. Many different consequences follow upon these two kinds of interactions, which coexist and interact on a daily basis. But gifting has been categorized as morality, while exchange seems to be reality. Change, please. The economy and logic of the first part of life have been eliminated by, from Euro-American academia, which is patriarchal and market-driven and the paradigmatic character of the maternal gift economy has not been visible to it. Although the mother's socioeconomic status within the patriarchal market economy and its effect on children has been studied, and although infancy and early childhood have also been studied intensely in recent years, there has been no serious treatment of mothering or care as an independent or indeed the primary economic model. Thus the perspective or superstructure of the maternal gift economy in which everyone begins life 
has been eliminated from the humanities, philosophy, ethics, epistemology, psychology, linguistics, the social sciences, anthropology, sociology, economics, and, and the natural sciences, physics, chemistry, biology, neurobiology. Even those disciplines having to do with children and childcare do not envision the existence of the maternal economy based on giving to satisfy needs. The closest we Euro-Americans come to it now is attending to the description of indigenous economies by indigenous people themselves. In fact, perhaps because they are not patriarchal and many of the men have not given up the maternal paradigm that is integrated into society, they do not see the gift as specifically maternal gendered female only. And this is a shining example for us to follow as to what could happen if we give up patriarchal capitalism, embrace the gift economy beyond gender, and integrate the maternal paradigm and values into our own societies. Perhaps I could just stop here, but in order to understand, avoid, and perhaps heal the patriarchal thought patterns that have brought us to this time of global emergency, I want to add another piece to the theory that I've been working on for years. Um, in fact, I believe there is actually a moment of childhood in which in patriarchal capitalism, the formation of the boy child's masculine gender and the exchange of economy, of the exchange of commodities for money coincide. When the importance of the maternal gift economy becomes visible for both the construction of gender and for the equation of value in the process of exchange, this parallel can at last be seen. I'm, I think this is probably a, a, a rather, uh, may seem a rather wild speculation, but at, at any rate, I've been thinking about it a long time and I really think there is a, a, a key thing that happens here. Marx's ex explanation of the equation of value between commodities and money is the key to understanding the commodity's alienation from the gift economy and of the boy from the maternal world. This is an important realization for us, which can only occur if we recognize that there is a gift economy. If we naturalize and hypostasize exchange, we cannot see the gifting of which it is a variation and in which it is embedded. But there is actually an important psychological correspondence here with the moment of the boy child's alienation from the mother, which I will try to describe in a minute. Change, please. So there's the gift value and intrinsic value. I mentioned that in the process of unilateral giving, the giver implies the intrinsic value of the receiver. Because otherwise, if the receiver had not been valuable for her, she would not have satisfied her need. What is given, the need satisfying good, is a transmitter of this gift value. In fact, it is usually made as appropriate to the child's specific needs as possible. The implication of the child's intrinsic value can be registered by the child as self-esteem. This is a value relation that happens before the exchange relation in the life of the child. It is also prior to the re exchange relation in daily life, in the domestic sphere, in the home, as opposed to the market. Change. In the process of exchange, the intrinsic value of the child for the mother and the gift value of the goods that transmit that value are depersonalized and transformed into use value and exchange value. While the product that is used by the mother to nurture the to nurture the child is adapted by her for the child's specific needs, the product that is taken to the market only has an impersonal use value. That is, it can be used by anyone for that particular purpose. And it does not imply the value of the receiver because in fact, the receiver here is an exchanger and the transaction is not based on gifting, but on exchange. 
So the product does not have gift value or imply intrinsic value, but it only has exchange value. As an exchange value, the product is related to all the other products on the market, specifically in that branch of production and made by anybody for the purpose of being exchanged. Therefore, again, it is not a transmitter of gift value, implying the intrinsic value of a specific other, but it only involves membership in a category of products that have been made to be exchanged. Money is the standard and the instrument for measuring all of the products in this category reciprocally as to the quantity of their exchange value. It does this by taking their place over and over in exchanges. The spread of the market, urbanization, specialization of production, industrialization, etc. have made it very difficult to supply needs without participating in market exchange. This has made it difficult to recognize the primacy of gifting over exchange and has further discredited mothering as unwaged housework instead of recognizing it as what it actually is, the practice of an alternative economy. This alternative maternal economy is difficult in practice because it is trapped within a generalized exchange economy that extracts gifts as profit. When the boy child realizes that he is not in the same category with his gift giving mother and that his social role is not to be like her, he is in a position similar to that of the product that is sold as a commodity on the market. He leaves the maternal gift economy mentally and joins the ranks of other boy products that find their value through their common relation to the male, usually paternal standard, and thus also their relation to each other as similar and to their mothers and sisters as different. There are some individual variations here that I am leaving out in order to describe the big picture. There are boys who have nurturing fathers and girls who have capitalist mothers. I believe these are variations that have not yet been strong enough to alter the patterns. Sorry. It's just sorry. Uh. The maternal gift economy, in, in patriarchy, the maternal gift economy then becomes subordinated to the exchange economy for the boy. And it seems the, mo the mother perhaps betrayed him by not letting him know he was different from her, giving him away to the standard, or not being herself the standard, as she would have been in matriarchy. The gift-giving mothers and daughters give to and serve the fathers and sons, and the gift economy serves the exchange economy. The fathers and sons are those who have substituted or exchanged the exchange economy for the gift economy, which they have given up in order to conform to the patriarchal standard, which becomes a standard of value by which each non-gift or non-gifter can be assessed and but which does not assess gifts as such or, or evaluate gifts as such. These different configurations of relations have psychological repercussions that have been discussed by Freud in the Oedipus complex, Lacan in the mirror stage, the name of the father and the symbolic order, and many others without recognizing their real world economic foundations in gift and exchange. This would be an interesting discussion for another time, but I can't go into it now. What I want to say now to conclude is this. The market economy is the context in which most people live now in the so-called developed world. And most people engage in exchange many times daily and derive their livelihoods from it in one way or another. Thus, this alienating equation X amount of product equals Y amount of money is validated as reality by its ubiquity. It's everywhere. 
As a move away from gifting, which also disguises the gift of the profit it transmits, and as an unacknowledged abstract replay of the male gender construction, the equation of value in the exchange of commodities is a thought structure that validates the denial and plunder of gifts and the unacknowledged role of the supremacy of man. The equa equation of value in exchange is like a mechanical implant in our brains and in our daily market interactions, making us deny and exploit gifts wherever we find them and applaud those who best succeed in this enterprise. Women as well as men, races, classes, and nations, as well as individuals can be piloted by this gift denying and exploiting mechanism. Recognizing and embracing the maternal gift economy as a human economy for all can help us recognize and eliminate the thought structures of the patriarchal capitalist exchange economy and eventually dissolve its social and material structures as well. Then we will see how our capacities of care, communication, language, and relationship are also formed on patterns of giving and receiving and giving forward, giving again. This will allow us to put ourselves back into alignment with the gifts of life on earth, sunlight, photosynthesis, air, cycles of rain, weather, and all the innumerable ecological niches that fit together, give to and receive nurturance from each other. We will give up being a self-alienating species and evolve to live in harmony with gift-giving Mother Earth. Thank you. Beautiful, Jen. Thank you so much. Every time you speak, I learn something more and it just drops in in a, a much deeper place. So um, I look forward to any questions that um, our attendees have for Jen. And um, we'll come back to you at the end when all the speakers have presented. So thanks so much, Jen. Thank you. We're very excited. Um, by the way, Jen currently is in Italy. So we're moving next to um, Heidi, who is calling in from and with us from Germany. Heidi, um, will be presenting her talk, A Radical Alternative Matriarchy. Heidi Gutner Abendroth is a mother and a grandmother. She earned her PhD in philosophy of science at the University of Munich, where she lectured for 10 years. She has published on philosophy of science and extensively on matriarchal society and culture and through her lifelong research on matriarchal societies has become the founder of modern matriarchal studies. Her magnum opus, Matriarchal Studies, Studies on Indigenous Cultures Across the Globe. She defines scientifically this new field of knowledge and provides a world tour of examples of contemporary matriarchal cultures. In 1986, she founded the International Academy Hagia for Matriarchal Studies in Germany and has since been at its director. So please welcome Heidi. Thank you so much, Leticia, and uh, all who invited me, Genevieve. I'm speaking about a radical alternative matriarchy. First point, what is a matriarchy? It is becoming increasingly clear that we need a radically different cultural model on all levels of society the destructive patriarchal patterns which bring humankind ever closer to the brink of extinction. Matriarchal societies are radically different and they have great significance for our future as women and mothers and for humankind in general. The social, economical, political and spiritual patterns are of utmost interest. They demonstrate how societies can be created and maintained free of violence based on gender equality, as well as on gift economy and active peace building. Matriarchies are not just the reversal of patriarchy with women ruling over men, as the usual misinterpretation would have it. 
Matriarchies are mother-centered societies. They are based on maternal values, caretaking, nurturing, motherliness, mutual respect and support, complementary equality, peace building by negotiation. All values which hold for everybody, for mothers and those who are not mothers, for women and men alike. In that way, matriarch societies are consciously built upon maternal values and motherly work. And this is why they are much more realistic than patriarchies. They are on principle need oriented and not power oriented. The precepts aim to meet everyone's needs with the greatest benefit. So motherhood, which originates as a biological fact, is transformed in matriarchies into a cultural model. Let us have a closer look at the patterns of matriarch societies. As I have often described them, them on all four levels, I summarized them here in the most extreme gravity. On the social level, matriarchies are built on kinship in the mother's line, whose main features are clan organization based on matrilineality and matrilocality. Last, the last means residence with or near the mother. This puts mothers at the center and they guide and they guide their clans without ruling. At the same time, the genders and generations are valued equally, despite their natural differences, which are regarded as complementary. So I call matriarchies on the level, on this social level, non-hierarchical horizontal societies of matrilineal kinship. On the economic level, matriarchies are societies of perfect economic balance, in which women are the, in which women are the custodians of the goods for life, such as land, houses, and food. They have no right of ownership, but of distribution, and they pay constant attention to balancing the economy through equal distribution. Such an economy has the qualities of a gift economy. On the, econo on the economic level, I call matriarchy societies of economic reciprocity based on the circulation of gifts. On the political level, matriarchies are based, uh, matriarchies are led by consensus with a political basis in the clan house where the decisions making, where, where decision making takes place. And with a system of male delegates to the diverse councils outside, where no decisions are made, but the decisions of the people in the clan houses are communicated. This gives men no power to decide over others, but give, gives them their own sphere of activity and social status. Therefore, on the political level, I call matriarchies egalitarian societies of consensus. On the cultural level, matriarchal people practice a deep supporting and all permeating spirituality. They regard divinity as immanent, for the whole world is regarded as divine, as feminine divine. Therefore, on the spiritual level, I call matriarchies sacred societies and cultures of the divine feminine or goddess. By this short characteristic, we can see how much matriarchies differ from patriarch societies, which are based on weapons, war, violence, and each and in each form on power over, over other humans and over nature. Now, when we imagine a modern matriarch, now, when we imagine a modern matriarch society, it will be a radically different model of what of all what we know. Of course, we cannot imitate traditional matriarch societies, but we can gain much stimulation and insights from them, which, unlike theoretical utopias, have been lived over millennia. Now I come to the second point. Matriarchy as a radical alternative. On the social level, the model of matriarchy means escaping the increasing fragmentation of society 
which drags humans being, human beings down into a state of separation and loneliness and renders them sick and destructive. Rather, it means developing patterns that foster various types of affinity or intentional communities, such as communes, alliances of neighboring groups and networks. Affinity communities arise from a spiritual intellectual common ground through which a symbolic clan develops, resulting in a group that is more deeply connected than a mere community of interest. The major archa principle here is that such affinity communities of a modern matriarch society are initiated, supported, and led by women. The determining criteria are the needs of women and children who are the future of humanity rather than the power and virility aspirations of men. In such new major clans, men will be fully integrated but according to a different value system that is one that is that is one based on reciprocal care and love rather than on power. On the economic level, further increase of large scale industry of expanding military and so-called standard of living would not be possible considering the danger of complete destruction of the biosphere on the life of Earth. Here, the perspective of alternative local and regional subsistence economy arises. For the subsistence perspective means economic inter in independence of the people of each individual region. Subsistence entities engage in self-sufficient and independent activities in which quality of life takes precedence over quantity. This does not only mean doing local gardening and agriculture, but also fostering regional communication, trade, technology, and arts. Even producing high technology is possible on the regional level if the monopolizing by the transnational corporations will be finished. Regionalization of agriculture, trade, etc., for the benefit of women and their communities is a matriarchal principle because they are the basis of human life on Earth. On the level of political decision making, the matriarchal consensus principle is necessary for a truly egalitarian, modern matriarchal society. It can be practiced here and now, immediately and everywhere. It is the inspiring stim stimulus for creating any matriarchal community. It establishes a balance between women and men and also between generations, as the elderly as well as the youth are able to have their say. In addition, it is really the basis of democracy, as it manifests what former democracies promise but fail to deliver. According to this principle, the small units of the new matrix clans are the actual decision makers. To implement the consensus principle in future means to develop a system of councils, smaller and broader, which are all interconnected to make decisions on the communal, local, and regional levels. The consensus principle cannot be practiced beyond the region, but in the matriarchal vision, independent, flourishing regions remain the political goal. On the spiritual cultural level, it is mandatory that all hierarchical religions with belief in transcendent divinities and claims of absolute truth which have deeply debased the earth, humanity, and especially women, must be rejected. Rather, we are creating a new sacralization of the world, consonant with the major art perspective that the entire world and all what it includes is divine. This leads to freely and creatively honoring and celebrating life and the visible world. 
In this way, matriarchal spirituality can be pervade every life, can pervade everyday life and become a normal part of it. Now I come to the third point of my speech. How can this vision of a modern matriarchy be implemented? The basis demand to make this possible is that the economy is given back into the hands of women, or it should be at least an equally shared economy. Why is that necessary? Let me talk in short about the women's situation today. I quote a brief summary from the United Nations report on the situation of women worldwide. Women make up half of the world population, work nearly two thirds of all hours worked, receive one tenth of worldwide income and own less than one hundredth of worldwide property. What a scandal that is. Yet no one seems to get worked up about it. But if women believe a lot has changed in the meantime, they are mistaken. In 2010, the president of the United Nations Economic and Social Council cited the following figures. Women work 66% of all hours worked worldwide and produce 50% of the food. But they get 10% of the world income, own 1% of the property, and represent 60% of the world's poorest. This was the situation in 2010, in 2020, and so on. The United Nations report on the situation of women worldwide is published annually, but nothing changes. We therefore demand an equally shared economy. That means a fair distribution of the world income and wealth as expressed by the national wealth of each individual state. To put it short and clearly, the fundamental demand is 50% of all national wealth belongs to women, their communities and projects. Equally shared economy in all its aspects. At present, working women pay the same taxes as men. Millions of mothers work free of charge, as well as other caring people. And working women everywhere earn much less than men. But 90% of the monetary flow, wealth, falls into men's projects. Transnational corporations, monumental prestige architecture, huge sports stadiums and events, and above all, military and wars. This must definitely come to an end. Let us, in short, imagine what, what would be the results if this situation is changed. If women would own half of the economy, which belongs to them, but is continuously stolen from them, they would no longer be beggars for their own projects. They could run their own institutions independently of male dominance, male values and worldviews. That means, socially, women establish new matriarchal communities related by blood or affinity with their affinity sisters and brothers. Their houses are multi-generational, multi-generational. Motherhood is collective. There is no more isolation of mothers in nuclear families, no social isolation of persons of any age group. It means economically. Women own land and set up local subsistence economies and cooperatives for themselves and their communities, gardens, farms, their own stores, their own distributions, sharing and gifting of goods. Every extended family or symbolic matriarchal clan set up by women receives its own house. 
women's villages are established. They would include men who also embrace the maternal values. Politically, women are the organizers and keepers of the consensus principle in their communities or symbolic clans, and also organize it on the local and regional levels. Practical bottom-up politics prevails. No more abstract top-down party politics. Women have their own councils and self-administration at communal, local, and regional levels. Men have theirs as well, and communication between women's councils and men's councils takes place on an egalitarian basis. Women and men refrain from male-dominated institutions, leave them, and don't support them any longer. Culturally, women start their own education systems, schools, colleges, academies, and universities in accordance with their own knowledge and values, sharing it with everybody. Women have their own medical facilities and their own healthcare. Women have their own publishing houses, bookstores, and distribution networks. They have their own technical facilities. They have their own art galleries, theaters, and museums. Women create their own spiritual sites where they celebrate the earth and life together with their communities. Women and all people of their communities stop further destruction of the environment, the soil, the water bodies, the earth, and its plants and animals. Because it is women who want to protect the lives of their children and of the future generations. In that way, new communities, cooperatives, and institutions created by women would quickly arise and flourish, which are truly mother-centered and egalitarian. That means nothing else than a modern matriarchal society would arise. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you, Heidi. That was so beautiful. I loved your last line, you know, matriarchal societies arise. May it be so, may it be so, may it be so. And for all of you present and listening now and in the future, um, I had the pleasure of being part of Heidi's very first English uh, symposium it was an intensive on modern matriarchal studies where we had 17 women, I think, from all over the world who attended in person, of course, in Germany at her academy. And we created a matriclan there, women who we could rely on and continue to converse. So I want you to, um, I want to encourage you if you have the opportunity, because this notion, this uh, reclaiming is essential to be able to wrap your mind around and embody the principles of the maternal gift economy. So the two are just perfectly uh, dovetailed together. So thank you so much, Heidi. It was very clear, your call to action. I, I'm with you with that because we can't do the maternal gift economy without modern matriarchal studies. And so thank you again, and we'll hopefully have some questions for you at the end. But now I want to introduce to you our third speaker, which is Meg Mahan. Meg Mahan is in Canada. She's actually from the Wabanaki Nation, one of the tribes there. And um, Meg Mahan's community is still engaged in their indigenous ways with their language that has them embedded in this notion um, in the indigenous economies that are simpatico with the gift. So she'll be introducing a concept to us. Um, I'm not going to say the word her, her in her language, but I'll give the subtitle, the continuance of life safeguarded through the conscious unification of the collective. Now, 
in their language, it's one word. So you can understand why it's difficult to communicate uh, sometimes across culture and across language because they have one word and that was what? I don't know, several words to convey the same concept. So Mig Mahan is a Wabanaki grandmother from the Jagik Kwa, tra, uh, clan and community member from the Burnt Church. She's a mother to three wonderful adults and grandmother to five beautiful grandchildren. Her life has been devoted to the Wabanaki cultural revival and promoting an understanding of matriarchal culture systems. Currently, McMahon is an elder in residence at St. Thomas University in Fredericton, New Brunswick. In this role, she provides the support for First Nations students and offers opportunities for them to learn from elders and traditional knowledge carriers, an important link between the university and First Nations communities. Mi'kma'han is a co-chair on a national committee on the Healing Through Land initiatives, a collective effort to reorienting grant making to align with indigenous ways of knowing and being, finding ways to amplify and accelerate the programs and organizations that enable this healing work. She's also a member of Women of the First Light, an indigenous women-led initiatives to support women in their local communities with the, uh, um, issues as food sovereignty and healing through land work. Welcome, welcome, Big Mahan. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Jen and Heidi. Uh, so I wanna, first acknowledge uh, and uh, express my gratitude in my mother tongue. Um, and uh, I, this is a very important part of the work in, um, in upholding and maintaining our worldview and as a people, and so even speaking in English is um, to to maintain the uh, integrity of our worldview, and in the language, in a patriarchal language, a matriarchal language is very difficult, uh, and uh, much of our words cannot be translated into English and. A lot of the speakers have uh, in our regions is now really looking at uh, translating English language uh, uh, into our mother tongue because our languages are uh, women focused and uh, our elders consider the language and know the language to be very sacred and holds its own uh, holds its own connection uh, to life. And so there's been uh, some decisions about, about that uh, and not using the indigenous language in translating English because of that understanding of what that means. So uh, honoring all the ancient languages of the world all the ancient mother mother tongues. I wanted to uh, extend my um, gratitude uh, in my in my language before I uh, continue what I will be sharing. Mi wedam dan deliganadiak ebideu diak, dan delusit hamuadiak, dan deli, dan deliganadiak, a kiskuk, mawidam, dan desu diak ebideu diak, usit hamu, a bajuna had ne, imajuahan, a bajima wadune, a bajik saltu dine, a bajik lamsadasu dine. A habaji 
angkat temen edang gedudel baulu guduh tik ucit munahal duk gelok mimajuahan ahang kijino angkweyuk ah kuku mijinah tande situ sithamu kis buku weda kis kinamuk sik siawaduan negamau kluswahan mua ei mudiek ahan mi mutasnan dan der sit ni wo kama stohon wisus sisip da dem sit when night wicked and kitchen up utlami look mau hada modi ka mau ya bohon maru tene abijili de lo mane wa ki la li ak na chit na so thank you I wanted to um, bring a uh, something that is really important that uh, for I know for all of us and I hear I've heard this now from uh, Jen and Heidi and I've heard that from Leticia and the women that uh, I've been had the honor and pleasure of sitting in the circle with and hearing. Uh, the the work that is going on uh, worldwide and uh, at the international circles and in we're we've been uh, the Wabanaki people, which is the people of first light in our homeland, is uh, been uh, first exposed to patriarchy. Uh, on this side of the continent, uh, but the language is still very much alive for us, and it's the language that has returned in uh, the spirit of our ancestral grandmothers. And when you we look at the the language, as I had explained in previous uh, times that I've sat with Jen, that our languages were outlawed. And as you know, those ancient connections, those ancient languages that have been with us in the beginning of time are still profound and that they are still alive and they are very powerful guideposts to uh, who we are as women and how we move forward in uh, with our own uh, motherness, our own grandmotherness of uh, reclaiming or restoring life, uh, humanity and all life on uh, this great life. And we still have a language that still gives us that visual and worldview and that it is still very possible even though Indian reservations in North America are um, the most uh, federally relegated and controlled spaces. It's the language that holds that spirit, our mother tongue that continually grounds us uh, to our worldview and what that means. And so, uh, for the, for the men who still understand and hold that language also is working from a maternal, maternal experience and this maternal focus. So um, there's, and there's not a much uh, references outside of our maternal circles in our own family, in our own communities. And it's very encouraging uh, and hopeful to know that the Western systems uh, out there and uh, for sure the academic institutions uh, are, have, are working and have come forth with this information and uh, are um, aware of the value and importance of uh, maternal cultures. There is uh, much to share from a communal uh, experience and my uh, personal life uh, in, understa in understanding the language. Um, 
and I wanted to share um, the the word um, Abohan Madi, which I'll I'll give you a visual of uh, shared a visual of my screen just to make a reference to it. Well, in the Mi'kmaq worldview, our languages, as I shared, as our, our language has always been a guidepost to how we live with and among our kin relations, kin relatives. I will share the principle of Abohon Madi, which describes our relationality and communal way of caring for each other. This has been taught to us by our original teachers, which is the plants, truly the plants, animals, trees. It's, it's the foundation to our way of life and acknowledges life has gifts worthy of being restored and maintained for a collective well-being. Abu Hanmari is a pathway to reclaiming matricultural way of being and upholds individual dignity by collectively wrapping ourselves in a circle of protection as mirrored in our animal relatives. Abu Hanmari, our original way of being, is an antidote to patriarchy, capitalism, and war. The examples uh, given that I'd like to share is the, the forest fire uh, uh, and reindeer circling the vulnerable ones. And in this, this imagery, this imagery that I share, it's they, the reindeers are circling because of the forest fire, but they're still in the, the uh, this, uh, farm uh, fenced in, but they sense and they are aware of that. And, uh, and just as uh, the buffalo, um, one buffalo will stay behind to act as a decoy. And so these are uh, the original teachers of of what our language is sharing with us. And Abohon Madi is how we circle and how we are. And so uh, when we have a language that still connects us to a worldview uh, and, a, uh, and a practice and a life way, I think that's one formula that is a key. And I so appreciate the uh, uh, what's been shared here so far about identifying uh, those key points of how we begin to bring uh, shift and uh, change or weave um, our the matriarchy, matricultural models back into modern day and how that what that means. And Abohon Madi in itself is uh, uh, an exchange or, or uh, uh, when we break down the, the word, uh, ah is the, the, the thought and consciousness. And it's a continual cycle and of rejuvenation. And boh, boh uh, is how uh, we come together, merge together and wrap and wrap ourselves. And so it describes how we, the relationships between uh, the young boys in our family and their role and the language that they're, um, uh, this is the, the worldview uh, that continually reflects and uh, with that we refer, make reference to of who we are as a family or as a collective conscious unit. And it's, we are, um, we are uh, struggling here in Wabanaki to uh, to decolonize uh, our languages uh, because our languages were outlawed for a number of generations, and now the work that's happening is um, healing our language and decolonizing 
our language and what's coming forward is what I'm sharing now, just through one word of Abohan Mali and how in that word, how we live together, this is how our social structures are and how we, um, uh, our responsibility and role uh, to humanity, to all life. And that the, uh, when we talk about our own origin stories, uh, we are not separate from the animal relations, from the tree relations. And these are building blocks of uh, the restoration in what we need to be, I feel, we, in our conversations here in our circles where we're reconnecting our children and to uh, our original instructions in and how does that look uh, in today's society. And so uh, the, we understand personally as women what happens when uh, in this society when women are not valued and as the statistics and the science that uh, both Jen and Heidi talked about of um, we, this is still very much present in our life. Women are not, uh, not much has not changed. In other words, uh, no matter where you go in the world. And so these, I'm here today. I'm not, uh, I am, my focus is at the, the ground level and I'm working at the ground level to bring forth the language and uh, reconnect and reintroduce uh, the, or, the origin of, of what our language means to us uh, in our homelands. And so when we begin to understand that, we're starting to build our, our own structures and our own understanding about the economy and uh, the social structures and our political systems based on uh, what the language is teaching us today. And, and I really uh, I'm convinced that when we began to research the ancient languages all over, uh, then we are going to find ourselves uh, deep in that ancestral root knowledge. Um, uh, I feel at times that I'm a bit off uh, and I, I tr try and uh, uh, bring something uh, to um, the work, to the incredible work that's happening around the, uh, among women who are uh, restoring and really looking at matriarchal cultures. Uh, what that means and how we can move forward and improve life on our sacred mother. And I would deeply encourage uh, that spirituality is at the root and the center of the, the work in womankind. And I know it's being shared in many different, um, it's verbalized in many different ways and how to connect deeply in that regard. Um, and I think at this point, I will probably just uh, leave, with, leave with that. And um, if there's any questions, I can probably respond. Uh, I'm very thankful for being here today uh, and hearing the work, the great work that's happening in the research. Um, I. I am deeply honored to be here. Um, and I feel that um, the, those ancient languages are, going, are the key to uh, restoring our worldview and uh, reconnecting all of us because it's the language of the same source, our sacred mother and the plant world is there. And uh, uh, whether it's uh, men or women, 
uh, we all have the same deep connection and relations when we speak with the, the original teachers and understanding our relationship to the cosmos and to the natural world. Uh, it's, as, as a mother and grandmother, they are the ones who taught us and they were the ones we were communicating with. And we were imprinting and looking to them as our references. And so the word Abohan Madi is, uh, was created of how we looked at the four-legged relatives, even the animal uh, plant world. If there's a forest fire uh, or a clear cutting, there's, it's a certain plants uh, and trees that first arrive to heal and mend uh, that space. And then the return so that they create an opening for the return of the rest of the family the rest of the plants and the trees. So that is almost a non-threatening uh, experience for uh, as well uh, with the young boys and all our families that are coming forward. I think humanity can certainly now, the younger generations will certainly now embrace that if we can shift our own thinking and truly establish a reconnection uh, of our relationship to the non-human world. And so uh, this, is, this is what I've been asked to bring forward in this circle. So, well, Alia, Megidele Munno, Akelo, Mimajuahan, Gay do in a hasik up church multosip. Thank you so much, Migmahan. Before you uh before I move on, would you say one more time the word in your language that reflects your the center of your culture? It's, it's can you unmute and say it again? Mm -hmm. oh, it's uh Abohan Madi. And it's uh, it's one uh, uh, one word uh, that uh, is woven into uh, another evidence of how we uh, how we take care of each other, how we look look out for each other, uh, and it's extended, and it's a teaching from our four legged plants. Uh, so those kind of connections are very important and actually so fundamental in uh, our language and our relationship. Um, thank you. Thank you so much. Yes, I look forward to a time we've been trying to figure out a way that in a, we put together a language salon that represents these ancient languages and the reclaiming of that, which I think would be vital for people to begin to understand uh, exactly what you're saying. I'm not a native uh, speaker of my indigenous language, but we also have a word that is, uh, you know, uh, we add things to the front and the back of it for fuller meaning. But kapwa, the self and the other, reflects the relationship that we have to all the dimensions of the universe that regardless of uh, human form or animal form, that we're seeing this interconnected reality and that we're all part of this same thing. So thank you so much for bringing that forward because again, we can't have um, the maternal gift economy or modern matriarchal studies without a return to recognizing the mother tongues and the way in which our language affects and infects our decision-making that we're doing today. So thank you so much. And um, I look forward to more and perhaps questions. Our next speaker, Darsha Navarez, is going to be speaking about um, the maternal gift economy, sharing morality and human nature. And what's so beautiful about the flow of our talks today is that Darsha is 
speaking from the point of view of what it means to be fully human as a human being, regardless of culture, regardless of anything else. This applies to what it means to be human, which is what both Heidi, Mahan, and Genevieve has been talking about, even though the terms that we have to speak distinguish and reclaim so that the maternal and female can at least be elevated as equal to be able to have that same value as our humanness. We need to emphasize that so that people can understand it. So um, Darsha is a professor emerita of psychology at the University of Do no Notre Dame, a fellow of the American Psychological Association, the American Educational Research Association, and the Association for the Advancement of Science. Born in Minnesota, she grew up living around the world as a bilingual, bicultural, Puerto Rican, German, American, but calls the earth her home. Her earlier careers included professional musician, business owner, classroom music teacher, classroom Spanish teacher, and seminarian, among other things. In her academic career, she employs a lifespan interdisciplinary approach to studying evolved morality, child development, and human flourishing, integrating anthropology, neuroscience, clinical, developmental, and educational sciences. In the recent analysis of 8 million scientists around the world, she was identified as one of the top 2% of the scientists worldwide. She has numerous publications, and I'm inviting you to please take a look at our website for her uh, Darsha's full bio and a way that you can connect. She has a six minute movie at her website, breakingthecyclefilm.org, which brings together the theory in a visual short film that you can take a look at. So without further ado, welcome Darsha. We're so glad that you've joined us again today. Unmute. Thank you so much, Leticia and uh, Jen and Diane and everyone who made this possible. It's really an honor to be with these distinguished uh, people, uh, heart-centered people. Uh, uh, hello from the traditional lands of the Miami, Peoria, and all, the, all of the Potawatomi peoples. I'm going to talk about stories. <clears throat> stories influence our conceptualizations about how the world works. Art and story create our consciousness and make our world. They shape our beliefs, feelings, and affect our actions. They guide our moral imaginations, our ideas about what can and should be. I'm gonna talk about two stories. The dominant story is that humans are unique, separate, and superior to the rest of nature. For centuries, Eurocentric Western scholars have been telling us that they are the best. They conquered the world. So isn't that proof? They, forgot, uh, they forget that plagues also conquered the world. <laughs> but they created technologies that entrance and govern the world today. Isn't that proof that they are the best? Actually, if you look around, the promised wonderland of technology is instead producing a vast wasteland. But they say their ways have had a large hand in a burgeoning human population. There are 8 billion human beings on the planet now. Isn't that proof of success? They forget that weed species act like this and eventually are eradicated once a more ecologically cooperative species comes along. The reality is that the dominant story with all its accoutrement, is ruining us, extinguishing animal nations, plant nations, waterways, disrupting every aspect of life on the planet. The question we must ask is, how does the dominant story maintain itself? The ancient story, the other story, the more important story, is one of a living planet, largely cooperative and sustainable, that supports life in all its forms, 
It's a kinship or partnership orientation to living with others, including the non-human. The challenge is, how do we bring back the ancient story? Let's start with that story. And this is where the maternal gift economy plays a starring role. <clears throat> the maternal gift economy follows nature's gift economy, an ecological system that keeps individuals and communities flourishing. One animal's waste is another animal's residence or food source. Through photosynthesis, plants make food for every living being. Plants produce oxygen, which our cells need. Our bodies, in fact, are filled with trillions of microorganisms keeping us alive and healthy in different microbiomes around the body. The vagina has its own set of microbiome. We live on a symbiotic planet. Our lives are shared with others. Sharing is a special part of human evolution. It distinguishes us from other primates. Other primates share little, if at all. Of 69 species, 30 don't share at all. 39 share only with offspring. Humans evolve to share with everyone. In egalitarian societies, very little is not shared. In sharing cultures, those in most need receive the most time, attention, materials, not those with more status or power. Sharing actually prevents the consolidation of wealth and power. Sharing infuses life in egalitarian communities and includes sharing access to knowledge, skills, positions, Thomas Widlock, a German anthropologist who has studied sharing societies, suggests that sharing is a skill learned throughout life. You practice giving up space for others, ultimately giving up one's own life to make room for others. Sharing then follows the cycle of life. In terms of need, young children are often the neediest. This brings us to morality. Feminist theorist Virginia Held suggested that child raising is best considered the center of moral activity because by facilitating the right kind of development, it fosters the best kind of new persons. My work focuses on what species normal child raising looks like. When we nurture children in species normal ways, meeting their basic needs through sharing, we foster their humanity and set up their trajectory for a flourishing community. What is species normal child raising? What have our ancestors practiced for millions of years that civilization has largely forgotten? It's only the last 1% of human existence that civilizations came about and disrupted species normal child raising. What is it? I call it the evolved nest. Common characteristics of the evolved nest have been identified in egalitarian nomadic foraging societies around the world. And we've identified and we study nine components. I'll mention a few here. Soothing perinatal experiences. That means mothers have extensive support during pregnancy and before that, of course, uh, and during birth, uh, birth is soothing, and there's no separation or painful procedures after birth, no separation of mom and baby. Breastfeeding on request with the baby in charge for several years, and that's shared breastfeeding, not just mom doing it. Affectionate touch most of the time in babyhood and no negative touch. Unfortunately, half of parents in the United States say they spank or hit their 12-month-old children. Not good for de brain development. I can say so much about this, but I'm just going through the list. Uh, multiple L parents. That means lots of people helping care for that baby and those children. The village of care. Social embeddedness and social support. Now, all these nest components, apart from birth and breastfeeding, are 
important for all of us throughout life. So to have multiple alloparents or mentors, to be socially embedded and feel social support, like we belong, like we have something to contribute, very important. Nature immersion is another one. We build nature connection and respect for our relatives, all our relatives, plants and animal nations. And then self-directed play, free play that children do throughout childhood. Let me note that during development, which takes 30 years or so in human beings to become adults, males need much more nurturing support for longer because they have less built-in resilience and develop more slowly than females. They have the more fragile uh, sex. This means that most males are especially underdeveloped in civilized societies leaving them vulnerable to big egos as defenses and stories or narratives that justify their underdevelopment, which I'll mention below. The evolved nest, which we study, represents love in action, forming a biology of love for child raising. We are biosocial creatures. Our biology is shaped by our social experience. With the evolved nest provided throughout life, individuals and communities thrive. If people are interested, uh, later I can go through the 30 or so characteristics of thriving that are apparent in uh, nested communities. It's important to underscore that the evolved nest is community provisioned. It's not the responsibility of one mother or the parents alone. Mothers need help feeding the big social brains of their children, which helps explain the existence of postmenopausal females, which is unusual for most mammalian species except whales. They assist in provisioning children's cal caloric intensive needs. Uh, this is called the grandmother hypothesis. In fact, as a result of culture and brain coevolution, the cooperative caregiving of the evolved nest fosters characteristics only humans seem to have, capacities for intentional teaching, systematic targeted helping, aversion to inequity, preferring egalitarianism, declarative language and communication, and cumulative cultural evolution. In cooperative caregiving uh, contexts, Children learn to relate to multiple others, not just mother, leading to wider attachment, greater social flexibility, and capacities for shared intentionality, something that experiments show that chimpanzees, in comparison to young human children, do not do, do not demonstrate. They do not share intentionality like human children. The evolved nest also fosters the ability to de-differentiate from uh, others, to feel one with others, to take their perspective, including with animals, and cultivates awareness of the un unmanifest, what cannot be seen or measured. In other words, the spiritual realm. If all this is our heritage, how did we get stuck in the dominant story? Of course, uh, uh, at first it was accidental, but then it became on purpose. The way to break a community is to break bonds with the children, disrupt mothering. This is what was imposed on native communities by settlers and governments in the United States, Canada, Australia, even until a few decades ago. What you do is you separate the children from the elders. Under normal healthy conditions, the very old and the very young are enchanted with one another. They are in the same mind space more aware of the unmanifest, the universe, connected to spiritual realms, more playful and open. You break the heart of a community with their separation. Governments used residential schools, kidnapping, and having children adopted by white families. But you know, this is what Europeans did with their own children. Mothering was undermined over thousands of years with patriarchy. Domestication of animals, monoculture, agriculture, city-state civilization, invasions, and slavery, all this broke up 
mothering. In the last 1,000 years, the robbing of the common lands by the wealthy created homelessness, starvation, refugees in Europe, and capitalism put the icing on the cake. To undermine our instincts for sharing, you must use punishments and impose trauma. Disconnection and trauma become the norm all around. Disconnection from the land, from place, from community, from relationships, from the self. And trauma is passed on from generation to generation. So really it's not surprising that some scholars argue that we are more like chimpanzees <laughs> than our own sharing egalitarian ancestors and cousins. Chimpanzees use dominance hierarchies. And that's what the dominant story tells us. But the dominators themselves have created these outcomes. It's my contention that the move away from cooperative child raising and the provision of the evolved nest has underdeveloped our species evolved nature, shifting brain functioning back to the primate mind, to survival systems, to an emphasis on ape-like dominance hierarchies and hoarding. So what is it that an unnestedness does specifically to the brain? When what is supposed to grow after birth is not cultivated through nestedness, our human nature then is underdeveloped, giving that primate mind more power. One's developmental trajectory is shifted, making us more disconnected and self-centered, necessarily so because we get stressed easily and stress makes you stupid and selfish. That's the way the body works, the blood flow shifts. And then individual seems like a good idea because you feel so isolated and disconnected and alone. The person's disposition becomes oriented to dominant submission hierarchies. They can develop a sense of inferiority or superiority, the latter a very dangerous mindset. The brain becomes threat reactive, easily triggered, Blood flow shifts for fight or flight, impairing thinking, making open-mindedness or open-heartedness unlikely. The right brain, which is scheduled to develop more rapidly in early years, is underdeveloped, impairing empathy, self-control, and higher consciousness. The Wetiko virus, cannibalistic greed, can take root more easily. I mentioned that males are more impaired than females from unnestedness. The individual and community makes up reasons for this, for male dysregulation, accepting what is as what should be, which is what I call shifted baselines. For example, narratives, stories, justify the underdevelopment of males, such as the Oedipus complex. Male aggressiveness, anger, and dominance are considered normal for men. Moral orientations become rooted in primitive survival systems. This means that morality and values are about scripted power relations, because there's no flexibility, in part from a lack of know-how, you didn't develop all those things that normally would develop, rather than about egalitarian relational attunement and mutual enhancement. Good stories tell us, teach us how to maintain contact with others with our hearts. The heart and sense of connection to all are suppressed, though, and ridiculed by the dominant culture's focus on left brain functioning, because the right brain's underdeveloped, and controlling masses with triggered fear. So we are saturated by the dominant culture's anti-love story, a story of competition over cooperation, scarcity over abundance, aggression over love, a story of destru destruction. How does the dominant story maintain itself? By undermining the raising of children and creating unnestedness for all. Unnested people are easily made afraid and controlled by authoritarianism. And they are attracted to stories of superiority and then uh, actions that promote that view. How do we return to the ancient story in the cycle of cooperative companionship? We reinstitute our heritage, the maternal gift economy of sharing and meeting basic needs. This entails putting children first since they are the most needy. 
when child and adult well being are the focus of communities and societies, providing the evolved nest to everyone, we can grow and maintain our humanity in a species normal manner. We join the wellness informed pathway that evolution, in effect, created. We then live lives of compassionate connection as partners with one another and with the earth. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darsha. Um, it's so clear that it just struck me, uh, the dominant anti-love story. You know, that is so clear. And I just wanna just highlight again, cause it seems dire that if you didn't get what you needed when you were growing up, but Darsha always reminds us and I wanna encourage <laughs> you to go back and take a look at her other talks on our salons that there are ways that if you didn't get what you needed in your childhood, Darcha, um, aren't there things on your website that people can uh, help them bring themselves forward and encourage themselves to actually evolve? Right. Yeah, not a lot of adults have to spend a lot of time healing themselves from their childhoods, right? <laughs> so better to do it right the first time, right? Thank you so much. Our next speaker is Mary Condren. We're always pleased to have her. She's so busy. She comes to us from Ireland. She's going to be talking to us about the motherland, the alienation, sacrifice, and war. Um, Mary Condren is the director of Women's Spirit Ireland and a research fellow at the Center for Gender and Women's Studies in the School of Histories and Humanities at Trini Trinity College Dublin. Her critical work concerns the role of violence and the discourses of sacrifice in contemporary politics. Her constructive work focuses on recuperating the indigenous female traditions of old Europe and Ireland. So for more information, um, we'll put her website in the chat also, and we'll also put Heidi's in the chat. But Welcome, welcome again, Mary. Thank you for taking the time in your writing and your teaching to join us today. Very much my pleasure. And thank you to all of you who have contributed so far. Um, it is a real honor to be invited um, to be part of this um, salon. Um, I'd like to pick up and I'm first of all I'm going to share my screen to make sure that it's actually going to work. Yes, there it is. Okay, um, I'm going to talk today about um, the motherland, alienation, sacrifice and war. And in that I'm going to pick up in particular, although it wasn't intended initially, on Jen's um, comments on male alienation, um, because I think this has a huge impact on what is going on today um, in relation to war. Um, and I also want to say that um, I'm going to be fairly critical about the, the roles that men play in war. And at the same time, I'm very much aware of what's happening in our world and um, between Russia and Ukraine and those Ukrainian who are putting their lives on the line to save their country and to save their people. And so my, my comments are not in any way meant to be specifically critical of anyone. Um, I work on the culture of violence rather than um, specifics. Um, and so I'm hoping that what I have to say today might have, um, might make some contribution to that. Also, I'm putting a lot of stuff on PowerPoint. I'm going to speak to the slides rather than read from them because there's far too much text there at the moment. Um, but they will be on, on the website in the future so that people can refer to them then if, if they so wish. So thank you again. And um, I'll just start, um, I'll just start with my um, presentation. Um, wars take many forms and um, the Irish experience, I'm going to be drawing a lot, a lot on the Irish experience um, because we are a colonized people um, we were colonized by many different people over them over many years. Um, and in the last several years, we have been trying to recuperate some of our indigenous um, traditions. And some of you might be aware that through um, Women Spirit Ireland, one of the things we've done over the past 30 years has been recuperating the traditions of Bridget, who is um, 
our indigenous figure of divinity and she was a troublemaker and a lawmaker and a hostess and many other things. But for the first time um, next year on the 1st of February, the Irish government is making the Festival of Bridget um, a public holiday. So there, are, I'm just telling you that because sometimes there are, we do make, um, minor, we do make some progress in these matters. Um, the wars I want to talk about to begin with, though, um, from the experience of the anti-colonial war in Ireland, is that sacrificial themes that were generated there were also used in the 35 years of civil war in Ireland from 1968 onwards. Um, and that very much informed my thinking, my um, academic work and my practical work in so many different ways. Um, what makes war intractable and what makes war so attractive? They're the questions that I'm looking at today. Um, what are the underlying unconscious issues that, may, that are operative and how can we begin to bring them to consciousness with the, uh, with the view to deconstructing them? Now, Ireland also has an, an indigenous tradition, and that's the other part of the work that I do at the, at the constructive level. Um, the ancient indigenous deities were called the Tuhidei, and they were called, they, one of the translations of them is people of the gifts. Um, also, Bridget Bruiger, um, in one, the life of St. Bridget, 23 out of 30 incidents concern her generosity. And she was a little, you know, she was pretty rough at some times because if people didn't, weren't generous, um, she had ways of cursing them and um, taking back from whatever they um, had been given. The Vanir also in Northern Europe were also known as people of the gifts. Um, the, in, in, the, in the living traditions, um, there's always an acknowledgement of the gifts. In other words, People today sometimes call this sacrifice, but in the Irish tradition, it was it was um, incumbent on anybody who received the gifts of the earth to pour a little bit back into the ground as an acknowledgement to the earth spirits, who are also maybe called the um, the the two the, the people of, of of God or the people of divinity. And there's a funny story about um, a man who was accused of stealing milk because um, he had taken some drops of milk out of something that was meant to go to the creamery. And so the case went to court, um, but he protested that the only reason he had taken it was that he had to, he had to give the gifts back to um, the two a day. And he was acquitted of, of robbery um, through that story. Um, now, Joseph Campbell talked about the, um, the great reversal and, and this is what I'm going to be talking about here today, because um, the, it, it's a great reversal. We went from a, a culture of the gift to a very different culture with very different values. Um, in the Greek tradition, for instance, Athena was born full blown from the head of Zeus. Um, Bridget is, um, was, say, was said to be the daughter of the Dagda, who was her father, but she had no mother. Um, women in, in, in the Furies, um, the, the, the um, Athena was responsible for putting the Furies under the ground. And of course, they were responsible for um, prosecuting any, any crimes against, against maternality and particularly matricides. But women were put under the ground um, and, and in the, in the Orestes, Athena put the Furies under the ground and men ruled above it. The same happened with the two Hidei and the Sons of Mill. The Sons of Mill were one of the people, uh, the, one of the layers of invasions to Ireland, um, and they represented the Hebrews and Christians. And when they arrived, um, our ancient stories tell us in classical manuscripts that they put the two Hidei under the ground and the Sons of Mill reigned above it. However, um, what we need to remember is that for, for four days of the year, the two a day were allowed to wander out like Samhain and Bialtana and Imbolc and Lunasa, um, because they were the unconscious of the social order. And if they weren't, uh, weren't uh, you know, allowed to come out occasionally, everything was going to be ex you know, very disrupted. Um, but in the great reversal, um, we tell those stories without understanding that this is actually 
um, a major epistemic shift in the sense that there's a splitting, a splitting here between um, the two Hidei and the Sons of Mill, and, and particularly the, the values and, and the, the consequences of, of matrilineality and matricentered and matriarchy, and the Sons of Mill who eventually went on to represent the religions of empire. And again, in other stories, such as the Babylonian Marduk and Tiamat, and um, Marduk cut his mother in two, and he lived on top and she lived underneath. Um, and so what we have here is a profound splitting um, that we need to begin to address. Um, okay, so with the rise of empire, um, with, with the rise, sorry, the... With the rise of empires, some of the things that are blocking my, my screen for some reason. Um, oh, yeah, St. Patrick and the gift. There's a great story about St. Patrick and the living traditions. Um, and the story concerned Crumb Dove, who represented the old pagan or indigenous tradition. And he was trying to reconcile with Patrick, who arrived representing the Roman church. And he brought St. Patrick a bull and, uh, and gave it to him as a gift. And Patrick turned around to him and said, you know, you're, I want you to, he took a piece of paper out of his pocket. Now in those days, there wasn't any paper, but this is the way the story is told. And on the paper, he wrote Ave Maria. And then he called out for um, a weighing scales. And he put the bull on one side of the weighing scales and the paper with the Ave Maria on the other. And of course the Ave Maria um, was a far more weightier, a far more valuable, um, component than the bull. And of course, by means of these, that by these means, Patrick, as it were, um, superseded, the, again, the culture of the gifts. Um, other main Christian themes um, were the original blessing of nature was replaced by original sin. The culture of regeneration was replaced by redemption. The Garden of Eden um, was replaced by the fall. And eventually, the whole ideology and theologies of sacrifice replaced the gift. And today in, in our culture, we still see all of these themes being, being replicated by um, consumer capitalism, um, where there's great competition for what Pierre Bourdieu calls the goods of salvation. Now, what we have then in, in, our, in the culture in which we presently live is what Julia Kristeva calls the sacrificial social contract. Um, the consequences are, the ends and means are reversed. And this is a, an, a, an extremely important um, point in relation to the culture of war. The role of creatrix has been superseded um, by um, the, the many ways mythologically males have taken um, credit for creation. Um, and at the end of the Orestian trilogy, um, Aeschylus's version of the Orestian trilogy, when Athena is putting the Furies under the earth, she says, let all our wars be fought abroad. Now, Melanie Klein, um, in, the, in the work of Melanie Klein, um, psycho psychoanalyst, she talks about this as the paranoid schizoid position. Fighting all our wars abroad, abroad um, means that the creation of otherness is at the heart of the sacrificial co social contract in which we lived. Othering is instituted as a prime mechanism of identity and the ends and the means are reversed. Um, and they're made possible by ideologies that extol the virtues of sacrificing oneself for the collective life and denigrate those who refuse to be seduced or dazzled by what we call now the collective libidinal economy, because the libidinal economy is driven by unconscious issues. Now, one of the philosophers to, um, to challenge this notion was Simone Weil. And as you probably know, she was a young French woman um, who joined the French resistance during the Second World War. She died of starvation because she refused to take any more food than was available to the local workers. Um, but she produced an extraordinary volume of work. She died at the age of 34, um, which has been hugely influential 
um, to many philosophers, including people like David McClellan, the Marxist, or Judith Butler. Um, at one point, I promised to put on an event, um, an international conference on Simone Weil, but then COVID hit, so that's put uh, an end to that one. But anyway, she talks about private interest, and a very important um, comment is a self-centered principle of action, but at the same time, restricted, reasonable, and incapable of giving rise to unlimited evils. She goes on to say, sacrifice takes on various forms, but it all comes back to the question of power, power seeking, owing to its essential incapacity to seize hold of its object, rules out all consideration of an end and finally comes through an inevitable reversal to take the place of all ends. It is this reversal of the relationship between means and ends, it is this fundamental folly that accounts for all that is senseless and bloody right through history. Now, the reversal of the relationship between means and ends. In the discourses of war, um, which I've collected over the years, um, we, hear, we hear statements like, we had to sacrifice this village in order to save it. The sacrifice to end all sacrifices becomes the war to end all wars. President Conant told um, a, a reporter, one of the principal reasons he had for advising me that the bomb must be used was that that was the only way to awaken the world to the necessity of abolishing war altogether. And that again was in the 1940s. Oliver Wendell Holmes once made a speech to the grads at Harvard, out of heroism grows faith in the worth of heroism. What the heroes actually do, though, is, is not mentioned. In sacrifice, then, with the reversal of ends and means, um, we have what is called, sacrifice is often called the pharmacos, in that it concludes both, both poison and cure. I would suggest, though, that it's also the sadomasochistic position. The sacrificial social contract is the same masochistic position. Soldiers are both victims and executioners. Simone Weil goes on to say is, what is this absolute and unconditional something that would somehow justify the establishment of a masochistic sacrificial position? It would in turn become a sort of super value because it would be put into the service of that absolute and unconditional something. That, by the way, was, sorry, was not Simon Bay, it was Franco Fanari in his book on the psychoanalysis of war. Um, he goes on to say then that a psychoanalytic quest answer to the question, or at least a certain type of psychoanalytic answer, leads us precisely and again back to food as the mother's original gift to the child. This is that absolute and unconditional something that men carry in the deepest part of himself as a love object transfixed and absolutized, as a sort of paradise enjoyed in the beginning, but quickly lost. And so human life becomes a continuous attempt, more or less hopeful or more or less desperate to regain this precious object. Um, so Fanari is talking about, about the lost gift. And he says, with one of these vicissitudes of regaining the original food and the unity with the mother and her last gift seems to be connected, the deepest origin of group formation. And by that, he means the group formation in the services of war. So the consequences of all of this is that the motherland in the sadomasochistic contract or the sacrificial social contract the motherland is a source of both love and hatred. Athena, I can never stop repeating that thing, let all our wars be fought abroad, because I think it's an extraordinary statement um, to come out of a classic of Greek literature. Motherland rhetoric makes these dynamics lethal. In psychic terms, the motherland represents the good mother of psychic fantasy writ large, while the bad mother is, of course, the enemy. And um, Robert Scott, uh, Nancy Houston, sorry, at one point wrote of war, the more one advances into evil, the more necessary to idealize what is good and to safeguard its purity. 
purer and purer, farther and farther away from the horror. Um, Melanie Klein, I was saying earlier, um, wrote about the, um, sorry, I'm trying to get rid of all these, these um, pictures that keep coming up blocking, blocking the text on, on my screen anyway. Um, Melanie Klein talked about inference and the paranoid schizo schizoid position. Um, and she spoke about it, the, uh, the ambivalence that infants sometimes feel towards the mother. The, the good mother is the mother who gives the breast. The bad mother is the, is the mother who takes it away or doesn't you know, deliver it on time. And then she talks about, you know, this can be reconciled by what Darsha calls the evolved nest. Um, when the infants begin to recognize that the same is the same woman who gives the breast and the same person who takes it away, and they answer what they call the depressive position. But in a very important um, article, she wrote um, about envy and gratitude. The, the bad mother, as it were, um, it, we try to get back, a, you know, that the, the depressive position is or so, sorry, the pre-depressive position is characterized by envy and gratitude. Now that has massive implications for our culture today because in the culture of the gift, the culture of the gift um, promotes gratitude. But in our, the culture in which we live, we, we, are, we are living in a culture of envy. Every time I switch on my emails today, I'm hit by Black Friday, come and get it, come and get it, come and get it. And envy is cultivated by unending consumerism. Um, and sacrifice, the discourse of sacrifice is the perfect vehicle, sorry, for holding those two competing stances. Um, envy and gratitude. And, you know, in recent in recent years, there have been several books written about the importance of Melanie Klein's um, work for our understanding of war and sacrifice. So, um, sorry, I, I, I can't see some of what my, my screen should be seeing. Um, in, sorry, in, um, Franco Fanari's work where he talks about war and the love object and all our wars being fought abroad. He talks about, you know, that the enemy is experienced as something who destroys our love object. And this is why men see war as a duty and why it's considered one of the basic human values. Those who make war are not driven by a hate need, but by a love need. Moreover, they feel they must accept the need for self-sacrifice so that their love objects might live. I think that's an extraordinary statement. He goes on to say that the fact that men see war as a duty toward their love object has been, I think, neglected even in Kleinian literature. The problem, if there is one, is to disclose the ambiguous character of war as an experience of love, for it's based on the alienation of the bad parts of the self, which are projected into the, into the enemy, um, who is constantly experienced as the, um, the, the destroyer of one's love object. So again, love and hate and war are, are, to, are together. And so again, going back to Melanie Klein and the paranoid the schizoid position, which is swinging between envy and gratitude. Sorry, I, I've already used that one. Um, sorry. Okay, we go back to Ireland um, and what, you know, what kind of evidence can we see from the discourses of 1916? Um, 1916 happened in the middle of the First World War. There had been, before 1916, a major movement towards home rule, and it was beginning to go through the British Parliament that Ireland, you know, should at least be granted some measure of self-rule. Um, and major um, movements had been, you know, developed on, in, that, in that context. But the First World War began in 1914, and there were many poets and writers and others who thought that this was Ireland's perfect opportunity to um, regain 
Irish independence. Now, hundreds of thousands of young Irish men, including my two um, grandfathers, um, went to fight in the First World War um, on behalf of the, uh, of in, in the British Army. Um, they did that because they were living in abject poverty. And as somebody said, they went because they wanted to put food on the table for their families and um, boots on their own feet. Um, but throughout the, um, at this time, in, in any case, uh, at Easter Sunday, the poets and the, and the writers and the others who decided to, to go for it with a, an arising uh, significantly on Easter Sunday, uh, and they were very uh, aware of drawing on the religious um, connotations of that day, and they called it the Easter Rising. Um, throughout all of their discourse, there were myths of the undivided Mother Ireland. So their, their idea was to get back to the undivided Mother Ireland. Um, the poetry was about the lost mother. The avenging mother was Britain. Um, symbolic castration might have, been, um, might have been occurred or perpetrated by um, some of the language. There were great... Um, songs. There were four green fields and one of them was in bondage and the mother, out of respect for the mother, we have to get them back. Now, likewise, in the um, other discourse, there were loyalist myths of Britannia, the United Kingdom of loyalty to the queen or loyalist myths of the motherland, which was actually Britain. And there was the rejecting mother also. And so motherhood reversal um, Nietzsche, in his famous work on Zarathustra, um, which I've always been very um, informed by, he wrote, to practice loyalty and for the sake of loyalty, to risk honour and blood, even in dangerous and evil causes. And other people mastered itself with such teaching, and thus mastering it became pregnant and heavy with great hope. Again, note the maternal language. For the creator himself to be the child newborn, he must be willing to be the mother and endure the mother's pain. Massive, you know, again, envy of the mother's body. body. Um, and Diane Taylor, in a very brilliant article um, on the Argentinian War, she wrote, what made the patria acceptable, perhaps even necessary within this discourse, was that she was not credited with giving birth to her children. On the contrary, the glorious military men gave birth to her. Again, the great reversal that um, Joseph Campbell spoke of. Now, what does that mean in terms of Ireland? W.B. Yeats wrote um, a poem before, um, I'm, actually, I'm not sure about the date, but it reflected a time um, when the Irish nationalists were plotting to overthrow Britain. And the first line, the first few lines were, words are lightly spoken, said Pierce to Connolly. Maybe a breath of poetic words has withered arrows tree, or maybe but a wind that blows across the bitter sea. The poem ends with, where can we draw water, said Pierce to Connolly, when all the wells are parched away, or oh, plain as plain can be. There's nothing but our own red blood can make a right rose tree. And that notion of um, blood, male blood shed in war as being the ultimate fertilizing fluid runs, is not, it's not specific to Ireland, it runs right through the discourse of the First World War. But when the rising happened, um, initially the Irish people were absolutely outraged um, against those who had perpetrated it because they were a fairly, they were a minority. Most of, the, most of the Irish men had gone off to fight in the First World War. These were the poets and the teachers and they were outraged. But what did the British do? They took them in and they executed them. And so all of a sudden, far from being, you know, um, ragamuffins or, uh, you know, un, um, irresponsible people, they became heroes through their sacrifice. And again, Yeats, after 1916, wrote another very famous poem. I, I'm only quoting a little bit of it here. Too long a sacrifice can make a stone of the heart, and when may it suffice? This is heaven's part, our part, 
to murmur name upon name as a mother names her child when sleep at last has come on limbs that had run wild. But what is it but nightfall? No, 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 not night, but death. Was it needless death after all? For England may keep faith for all that is done and said we know their dream enough to know they dreamed and are dead. And what if excess of love bewildered them till they died? Now that, that statement, the excess of love bewildered them till they died. This is the, the epitome of the kind of alienation that currently runs through patriarchal culture and that is feeding war efforts all around the world. And I think we have to understand the, um, that alienation and the perversion of love that, that it represents. Now, so what I'm saying there is, there is a perversion of the gift, peace and castration. Um, after the insurrection, one of the writers wrote, Arl, you know, if we had accepted the liberation through, through um, diplomatic means, Ireland would have accepted the gift with shamefacedness and would have felt that her centuries of revolt had ended in something very like ridicule. We might have crept into liberty like some kind of domesticated man, whereas now we may be allowed to march into freedom with the honours of war. In other words, he's, he's, he's almost saying that war is a male initiation, right? Um, we go on then to Patrick Pierce. Now, Patrick Pierce was the main poet and, and dramatist of 1916. But he was a very disturbed man in some ways because one of the poems he wrote was called The Wayfarer. And he was reflecting on nature and he said the beauty of the world. And we, we, were, we all learned this poem in school, by the way. It was one of the first poems you learned as a child in, in an Irish school. The beauty of the world had made me sad, this beauty that would pass. Sometimes my heart is shaken with great joy to see a leaping squirrel on a tree or a red ladybird upon a stalk or little rabbits in a field at evening lit by a slanting sun or some green hill where shadows drifted by, some quiet hill where mountain man had sown and soon would reap near to the gate of heaven. Or children with bare feet on the sands or some ebb sea or playing on the streets of little towns in Connet, things young and, and bonny, happy. And then my heart had told me, and this is the crucial line, these will pass, will pass and change, will die and be no more. Things bright and green, things young and happy, and I have gone upon my way sorrowful. Um, in other writings of Patrick Pierce, um, it's very clear that he saw, he put himself in the, in the, um, in the image of Christ, whose job it was to save Ireland. Um, but how, how did he go about saving it? By instituting the Easter Rising in which so many men were killed and which followed, followed on by civil war in Ireland. But the, the crucial, um, when I was preparing for this presentation, this poem that I hadn't read in years kept coming into me. And, and here it is, it's a poem written to his mother. My gift to you had been the gift of sorrow. My one return for your rich gifts to me, your gift of life, your gift of love and pity, your gift of sanity, your gift of faith, for who had such gift as yours? I have seen your dear face, your face soft to my touch, familiar to my hands and to my lips as I was little. I have seen how you battled with your tears for me. And with a proud, glad look, although your heart was breaking, oh, mother, for you know me, you must have known when I was silent. I would have brought royal gifts and I have brought you sorrow and tears. And yet it may be that I brought you something else besides the memory of my deed and of my name, a splendid thing which will not pass away. When men speak of me in praise or in dispraise, you will not heed but treasure your own memory of your first son. In other words, he's giving his mother the gift of his own executed life. So um, we're living in, in what I'm calling um, a culture of a sacrificial social contract, a sadomasochistic contract, 
where ends and means are completely reversed. Um, President Truman, when the first atomic war bomb was, was, had been dropped, he wrote, this is the greatest thing in history. Teharda Chardin, a Jesuit philosopher, said it disclosed to human existence the supreme purpose, the purpose of pursuing even further to the end of life, the forces of life, and exploding the atom. We took our first bite of the, first, of the fruit of the great discovery. And this was enough for a taste to enter our mouths that can never be washed away, the taste for super creativeness. Now, if that is not a statement of the envy of, of, of women and women's bodies, which again can be found right through all the initiation rites um, recorded by people like Mercy Eliade or Bruno Bettelheim and others, the taste for super creativeness. So, what I'm saying, you know, finally, is that we are living in what the philosopher Lucy Regari talks, the culture of the death drive. And the death drive, um, where it's never enough, nature is never enough, life is not enough. What we have in Western culture is a culture of eschatology, um, a life that is only a means to a means to another greater, more important life. Um, and Lucy Regara, you know, talks about the, the death drive. She says, you know, we're all born into dereliction, but men, um, men establish their death drives at women's expense. Um, so the culture of the death drive is the one in which we are living. The culture of the gift has been superseded um, and we, we bear the consequences today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary, for making that um, explicit. And Jen always tells us that if we can't see what the problem is, we can't actually choose a new paradigm. So we really need to understand what's happening in order for us to make that commitment to move forward. And what Heide and Jen and Ming Mahan and, uh, and Darcha have been encouraging us to do is to remember, reclaim, and return to uh, what was there before. And, and um, in Ireland, the people of the gift culture, it's just so important for us to remember our ancient mother, mother tongues. And with that, our, our um, next and last speaker, I'm looking at the time, is uh, Susan Petrilli. And Susan, I'm so grateful that you were able to join us today. I know that you were still at your university today and, and had to uh, pop over. So we're, we're grateful that you could come and give us some insights. Uh, Susan's talk today is War, the Capital Sin of Globalization. Susan Petrilli is a professor of philosophy and theory of languages at the University of Bari Aldo Moro in Italy. She's the second Thomas Siobeck Fellow of the Semiotic Society of America, a fellow of the International Communicology Institute in Washington, vice president of the International Associations of Semiotics from 2014 to 2020. She has been a visiting professor in numerous universities. She currently teaches philosophy of languages, Semiotics, Semiotic of Translation. For her extensive bio and all of her publications and some of her articles, please do visit our website, maternalgifteconomymovement.org, so you can uh, see all of the wonders of Susan Petrilli. But for now, I'd like to give her the mic and invite Susan. Thank you. Uh, so thank you. Thank you so much for the invitation to be here with you. Uh, and I'll do my best to contribute uh, to this discussion. Um, it was a, a last minute invitation. So uh, because I'm teaching and there's not much time at all, what did I do? I decided to uh, write a text for my students. And so uh, I wrote a text and, and used this because it, um, uh, it, 
it um, is in line with the topics I'm covering in my course. So I wrote the text in Italian and then frantically tried to translate it into English and let's hope it works because I haven't had time to reread it. So here we go. War, a capital sin of, of globalization. I've divided the text in a series of uh, paragraph titles um, and we'll see how far we can get. So uh, point one, globalization, profit and war. Globalization in the current world uh, is the current world mode of exploitation. It is achieved through global communication and communication is vital. So globalization decides about the life and death of the inhabitants of this planet. Globalization is the planetary extension of capital. Its only law is the law of profit, of interest, one's own profit, one's own self-interest, or translated more precisely, mos tua vita mea. In globalization, the adjective innovative is made to coincide with nothing less than destructive. The European Commission has defined the innovative uh, product as the product that destroys similar products already present on the market. Inevitably, competitiveness itself is destructive. The maximum manifestation of the destructive power of globalization is war. Though war is a characteristic mode for the human race of manifesting itself, never before as today can it signify the ultimate extinction of humanity thanks to progress in technology and the capacity for involvement to the very point of threatening world war. Are there alternatives? Only on one condition, that we recover mother sense sense of the maternal, sense of the gift, of gift giving, the sense of opening to the other, unconditional opening, thus on the condition that we assume a responsibility which is not of the identical order, but rather, if this word still makes sense, of the moral order. On our part, we still have hope, hope as a sign. Uh, I'm in fact working on, on, a, on a collective volume now, in, thus entitled Hope as a Sign, uh, such that we have oriented semiotics, which is a subject I teach, the general science of science, in the direction of semioethics, where I insist on the relationship between signs and values, signs, values, responsibility. So, uh, paragraph or section two, war as production, exchange and consumption. In the current production system, communication and production coincide. Communication does not only occur in the intermediate phase between production and consumption, the exchange phase, but pervades the whole production cycle. More precisely, communication today is production, exchange and consumption of communication itself. I'd love to uh, stop and comment, but if, it, if I do that, I won't get through the various points that, you know, we can talk about if they are of interest to you. More, and if we have time. More precisely, communication today is production, exchange and consumption of communication itself. This includes the transfer of energy, oil and gas pipelines and so forth. The final consumption phase is the condition for the production cycle to continue and for its expanded reproduction. We have to consume to produce. We have to consume arms to produce arms. And if we're, if we're producing arms, we have to consume them. The whole production cycle in the current social form and not only the intermediate phase, that of exchange, circulation of the market, presents itself as communication or better communication production. The globalization of communication production is not only a question of extending the means of communication and expanding the market at a planetary level, but is also about a communication production system that enters and englobes all aspects of human life, whether in the form of development, well-being, consumerism, or underdevelopment, poverty, and impossible survival, health or sickness, bulimia or hunger, 
integration or imagination, employment or unemployment, emigration functional to labor force or migration as the request for hospitality, uh, mostly denied, peace or war, traffic and use of legal merchandise or of illegal merchandise from drugs to non-conventional weapons, <coughs> sorry, women, children, human organs and so forth. And not only human life is englobed by the communication production system, all of life is involved, even compromised and put at risk, all life forms, human and non-human, over the entire planet. Uh, uh, there's Dante Alighieri in Paradise, who, as he's uh, rising towards God with, uh, with, um, with Beatrice, looks back and comments, looking at the earth this and says this small bed of earth that makes us so ferocious and and he was right in a global communication war uh, in sorry uh, in a global communication world where capitalism uh, where capitalism and the logic of identity closed identity progress together hand in hand so to say War is also communicated as essential to the production cycle. Beginning from the 91 Gulf War, war described as the extrema ratio is generally qualified as preventive war, just and necessary war, humanitarian war, a means for exportation of freedom and democracy. Most recently, it has been described as a special military operation, uh, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The response to war is war, war on war, thereby perpetuating what was intended to be eliminated in a global communication production regime in globalization. The result is recovery, confirmation and development of the war industry, a production cycle that is reinforced always again and in ever more sophisticated terms for the sake of infinite war as though in all this there were not in play the end of the human species itself, the end of life, the end of communication over the planet. And here the allusion is not to the reduced form of communication, um, what we are calling communication production, but vital communication, communication for life, life that is communication. Uh, section three, security and peace. We are very distant today from what was officially ratified uh, by the Helsinki Final Act. That is the final act of the Conference on Security and Cooperation in Europe, uh, which took place in 1975 and excludes war as a solution to international conflict. In addition to European countries, Supporters included Canada, USA, the USSR. Point two in the final um, in the Helsinki in the Helsinki Final Act is entitled "Refraining from the Threat or Use of Force," and establishes the following. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I'm not organised for a PowerPoint, so I'll just uh, read you this very interesting uh, paragraph from the Helsinki Final Act. The participating states will refrain in their mutual relations, as well as in their international relations in general, from the threat or use of force against the territorial integrity or political independence of any state, or in any other manner inconsistent with the purposes of the United Nations and with the present declaration. No consideration may be invoked to serve to warrant resort to the threat or use of force in contravention of this principle. No violence, no war, not even in the form of threat was admitted. Accordingly, the participating states will refrain from any acts constituting a threat of force or direct or indirect use of force against another participating state. Likewise, 
they will refrain from any manifestation of force for the purpose of inducing another participating state to renounce the full exercise of its sovereign rights. Likewise, they will also refrain in their mutual relation from any act of reprisal by force. No such threat or use of force will be employed as a means of settling disputes or questions likely to give rise to disputes between them. An important historical event that inaugurates the current state of affairs, today's current state of affairs, where war is on the agenda and even nuclear war is looming, is the Gulf War of 1991. Section four, security and war. So we just talked about security and peace, security through cooperation and dialogue. Now it's security and war. Another important document is that produced by the White House in 2002. The National Security Strategy of the Uni United States of America, a document produced, I repeat, by the White House. Here too, the theme is security, but the pathway to securing security is war. And peace, once again, is considered as resulting from war. Peace is, thanks to war, the peace of war. This document lists a series of rogue states against which wars were to be waged successively, among them Syria and Iran. The 1991 Gulf War acts as a divide between interdiction of war as a solution to international controversy, the 1975 Helsinki Act on one hand, and the 202, uh, 2002 White House document on the other. The 1991 Gulf War was the occasion for the introduction of the concept of just and necessary war, which circulated and was translated into practice. The principle of just and necessary war legitimized the massacre of human lives in territories under fire, military and civil lives, but especially the latter, unintentional collateral damage, as somebody declared. To this add destruction of the environment, of all life forms, of the land, of territory, uh, in social political terms as well, and with it destruction of its history. Subsequently, recourse to war at a global level was justified as an instrument for the resolution of national and international conflict, hence the sake of uh, for maintaining um, world order. This is a war presented as preventive war, humanitarian war, war on terror. The 202 White House document, national, uh, as I said, the National Security of the United States of America, proclaims that peace and security call for war to stop rogue states, including in Iraq and Syria, from shooting first, that is, preventive war, unending war. This type of war is still happening today to the great satisfaction of the war industry, which guarantees efficiency and duration, resilience and persistence, whether directly, officially and ostentatiously, or indirectly and underhandedly through illegal, illegal trafficking. Clearly, something has not worked in the language and the diplomacy of national and international politics. And thus, the rather smooth transition from planning and aspiring to peace and security, as delineated at the time of the Helsinki Conference, through to the wars of the 1990s, to the two year, uh, to the uh, year 2000 and onwards, the Gulf Wars, the Balkan Wars, Afghanistan, Libya, Syria, Yemen, Kurdistan, war over the African continent, Congo, Rwanda, Liberia and so forth and so on, all accompanied by extermination, murder and genocide. Section five, preventive peace and armed security. 
According to philosopher Emmanuel Levinas, the real problem is not so much uh, for the West, is not so much that of refusing violence as of wanting to avoid violence through violence. That is, by resorting to violence intrinsic to the struggle itself against violence. But war on war does not extinguish what it aims to eliminate. On the contrary, war perpetuates and justifies war. Violence in the name of a good conscience, a clean conscience. Uh, remember the principle that war is just and necessary. Preventive war is another name for infinite war. Preventive war is not a struggle against the institution of violence, but is itself violence and provocation of violence. Instead, what we need is preventive peace. Preventive peace calls for unindifference. The allusion here is to unindifference as described by Levinas, the expression of an original bad conscience. We could call it a dirty conscience. This is unindifference to the other, to others, autrui. Unindifference is responsibility for the other. But unfortunately, unindifference and responsibility are generally followed by a good conscience, a clean conscience. And a clean conscience ends up allowing one to avoid responsibility for others. Well and truly an illusion. And all this in spite of the condition of indissoluble intrigue, of entanglement, uh, what Levinas calls ethics, which bonds one to the other without escape. This is peace, but is, it is not the peace of war. This is peace as envisaged by the otherwise than the world as it is, by the otherwise than the being of things as they are. This is peace before the world as it results from war, a world that foresees world, the world war, the world as it is. It's a world based on the logic of identity, closed identity, of being. Paragraph six or section six, for a semi-ethics of the Helsinki Treaty. Adam Schaff, I, I won't go into who Adam Schaff is now because I don't know that there's enough time, but a, a philosopher of language and semiotician um, clearly understood the cru crucial importance of the 1975 Helsinki Conference and the document it produced, the Helsinki Final Act in 1975. Schaff knew that this document had become a dead letter. This is the tragedy. Consequently, he invited scholars from different nations and from different fields in the human sciences to begin investigation of the Helsinki Final Act in a semiotic key. We have carried on this work here in Bari, keeping account of ethics as understood by Levinas, what today we have uh, coined semioethics. Uh, we analyze documents in a semioethic key where it is absolutely important to insist on the relationship between signs and values, signs and ideology that permeates uh, semiosis, human thought, language, communication, behavior. So the next section, war and again, war for peace. In 203, military intervention against Saddam Hussein uh, who had been accused of possessing arms of mass destruction, which had not been verified neither before intervention nor after Baghdad had been destroyed. Um, so intervention against Hussein was also justified as a preventive war. But another justification was that this war served for the exportation of democracy. In spite of the lack of formal authorization on behalf of the UN, UN Security Council. Surgical intervention and the embargo had already produced an enormous quantity of deaths before the attack in 2003. Women, men and children punished for the sins of the Iraqi government, according to the law of retaliation against innocent people. 
um, the attack, oh, this is in Italian, yes. The attack of 203 uh, was carried out in, uh, under the slogan, shock and awe, and has certainly not produced a pacified world, a world in peace. Following the 203 attack, shock and awe, this was the motto of the Freedom for Iraq campaign, Foreign troops remained in Iraq for a long period of time thereafter, officially until 2011. And still today, as we all know, Iraq is all but a pacified country. The same is true of Libya. It too liberated, so to say, through military intervention, again by a US-led international coalition, this time under the presidency of Nobel Peace Prize winner, 2009, Barack Obama, awarded the same year he became president, and with the participation of Italy and France, among others. During the Intermezzo, wars have succeeded each other in the Balkans, the wars in Yugoslavia, the wars in Yugoslavia. Let us remember the war in Kosovo with the NATO military intervention in 1999 and participation from Italy Operation Allied Forces. Between 1991 and 1999, not only is war described as just and necessary, but is also justified as humanitarian, humanitarian military intervention, humanitarian military operations. To note is that Italy under the D'Alema government never formally declared direct intervention in Kosovo, a question of respecting the Italian constitution, which repudiates the war. That Kosovo, like other parts of former Yugoslavia, was struck with bombs made of depleted uranium derived from nuclear wastes, albeit in small doses and with long lasting effects, far superior to the immediate effects of surgical intervention is no longer mentioned. The thousands and thousands of deaths caused by these wars are mainly civilians. And it is the civilians, those who are still alive, the survivors, refugees, migrants, outcasts, the subjugated, deported, mutilated, offended, deluded, frustrated, angry, exalted, demented, that continue to suffer the consequences of this infinite war. In one way or another, civilians are the victims of a war that never ceases to cease. Like capitalism, connected to war, what can be described as blind capitalism, blind like a mole, deprived of the capacity for reasonableness, which is something different from reason, more than reason, insensible, that does not admit being called to issue that proceeds blindly, haphazardly, without reflecting on the consequences or blind in the sense of no way out, like a dead end, a cul-de-sac. Next section, war and migration. A consequence, not only of war, but of the globalization of capitalism is the phenomenon of migration as it currently presents itself today. Capitalism, uh, which is now blind capitalism, a sort of agonizing beast whose tail smashes lethal blows, but the air blows, but the end of its agony is still not in sight. Migration today is not identifiable with emigration, two completely different phenomena. Because unlike migration, the main characteristic of emigration is that is that it can be englobed by the production system, by the communication production system. Instead, the specificity of migration is the fact that it presents an otherness, an alterity, an excess that cannot be assimilated. Migrants represent a part of humanity that is not reducible to labor merchandise, to the status of labor commodity. Migration is an obstacle to the universalization of the market, to the unlimited extension of the processes of commodification. Homologation inherent to equal exchange is blocked in the face of migration. 
another symptom of a system that is not working is, of course, apart from war that we're discussing, uh, migration, unemployment, for example, poverty. This new face of migration manifested itself under our very eyes when almost 35 years ago, on 7th March 1991, 20,000 Albanese refugees, land, refugees landed in the port of Bari. The first wave had already occurred in the port of Brindisi just a few months earlier. Uh, we have dedicated volumes and collective works to these issues as well, uh, among which um, a volume entitled Migrazioni, uh, published in 1993, um, and in it, we uh, published two texts by Umberto Eco, who in 1990 had published a text on migration explaining uh, the difference between emigration and migration. Next section, the question. I just want to check in with you to see how much more time that you you will need. Probably we another 10 minutes, 10 can you wrap it up in in about five? <laughs> well, I'm very, sorry. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, look, I'll, I'll just read the titles um, of the rest, which is the request for hospitality and the request for work, where uh, I just go into uh, my the difference between emigration and immigration. Uh, underlining the fact that emigration uh, is part of the communication production system because we have people shifting across the globe that are absorbed by the workforce. Migration is something completely different. It's an excess with respect to the system so that what we have before us are people, migrants, who are putting the system into crisis, asking for hospitality, uh, a request that has nothing to do with identity, they're not asking for work, and everything to do with the properly human, singularity, otherness in the sense of, uh, we are in the sense that we are before this um, humanity that is asking to be welcomed, uh, to have a place and a possibility of survival on this planet. Um, and so I talk about human rights, uh, which is the title of another volume, collective volume that I've uh, published here in Italy, in Italian. Uh, and the fact that uh, when we talk about human rights and the rights of the other, which is the title of this volume, the point is that uh, when we talk about human rights, um, we're talking about the rights of identity and we're not talking about the rights of the other. Human rights are the rights of the I, uh, what Victoria Welby calls ident, of the ego. They are the rights of self-interest, an expression that describes the current state of affairs in the world is that used by Pope Francis when he denounces the globalization of indifference, each for himself, no need to add and God for all, now, an addition of little interest, including the fact of there being the same God, one God for all, each with one's own interest, one's own affairs, mind your own business, each centered on one's own identity, on asserting one's identity. And so the next section, the uniform of identity, uniform, an important word from military language. It distinguishes the regular soldier from the mercenary fighter, from the, the secret agent. It is somehow connected with the uniformity of genre and affiliation, identity genre. Based on indifference and opposition, all identities are put into a uniform, is called to arms, are called to arms, foresee conflict, are called in the literal and metaphor, metaphorical sense to arms. Um, and the risk now present is finding that we must deal once again with that absolute arm, which is the nuclear, nuclear arms. Uh, identity is a trap, a mortal trap, one that must be escaped as a condition for the future, for hope in world peace. Will we ever escape the trap of identity? And so there's a section on non-functionality versus productivity. And with the concept of non-functionality, uh, we are valorizing alterity, otherness, 
uh, the each one as a value in oneself for nothing uh, beyond before and beyond serving a specific end, an identity end, a role. Um, and so therefore I talk about, I explain the difference between relative alterity and absolute alterity, um, concluding that in today's, the right to non-functionality, to being what one is uh, beyond, uh, before and beyond uh, roles, identity roles. The right to non-functionality is the right to count on one's own account to count for oneself as an end in oneself. We're talking about everybody in their singularity. Therefore, uh, the weak the, the women uh, in their vulnerability, uh, the sick, uh, children, men, women, no distinction. Um, what is beyond, that which goes beyond the cage of identity. Um, it's it's if you think you know when when you have a friendship relationship a love relationship if you realize that that friend or that person that you love or you think loves you is interested in you for a reason because you're rich or because you're powerful or because you have a car or because you take me out to dinner or whatever uh, that is hurtful we we don't feel love we know that that is not love that is not real friendship so that's what I'm talking about, that other uh, before and beyond identity and the cages of identity. In today's communication um, production world, where fundamental values are development, efficiency, competitiveness, through to the extremeratio of war, the right to non-functionality assumes a subversive character and yet communication production in spite of itself today opens up ever greater spaces to the non the non-functional liberation of indifferent work in the form of unemployment which is spreading decommodification of traditional emigration in the form of unreducible migration we have to welcome these people help these people give them a place help them find a place on the planet to survive on and so forth non-functional is the human the properly human is the non-functional and nonetheless human rights do not contemplate the right to non-functionality such a right falls out of the sphere of the humanism of identity and yet it is at the very foundations of all rights i'll go to uh, so the next section is called the humanism of identity and the humanism of others. This is the way out uh, with respect to a, a world where identity is dominant and progresses with capitalism and sacrifices the other to identity continuously uh, and ever again. The proposal uh, as the way out is the uh, humanism of otherness. And this is connected to mother sense, the maternal, to gift giving. Other, what I call absolute otherness with Levinas. Uh, there's a section, um, yes, followed by a section on Victoria Welby, who in philosophy uh, in the 19th century um, works on the concept of mother sense. Uh, it's a philosophical part, and I won't go into that now, but you know, this is the way out, uh, I think. And so I'll read you. Then there's another section called for peace that does not ensue from conflict, from war. This is the last section. Um, I'll read parts of it. Sign production, the sign process, semiosis, is characterized by the, by the capacity for opening to the other, for multiplicity and by interrelatedness with the other, with the other sign, the other body, by intercorporeity, or what we can also tag dialogism, the capacity for interconnectedness, for participative involvement with the other, for listening to the other. And the other is not only the human other. Uh, and here, uh, the indigenous um, cultures can have everything to teach us. The vocation of the sign of semiotical activity overall, thus of the human as well, is dialogical, 
and indifferent interrelation with the other. It is only by practicing a philosophy of life set up in such terms, a vision of life inspired by values of this type, that it will ever be possible to stay well, to safeguard the well-being of semiosis, therefore of life. Semiosis and life converge over their entire planet. There is a demand for a need to dialogize, therefore humanize difference, according to the values that orient the humanism of otherness, alterity. In the name of identity difference, closed identity, barriers are constructed among differences, whether ethnic, religious, class or sexual difference. And in defense of identities conceived in these terms, therefore to the end of rejecting and expelling the other, sacrificing the other, walls are built and wars are justified, qualifying them as preventive, even humanitarian. There is no peace unless it is the peace of war, the truce of war, without the opening of identity to alterity and indifference to the other, which is responsibility for the other, responsibility without alibis is opening, an opening in reality to the other than being as it is, to the otherwise than being. This opening is not an initiative decided by the intentional subject, an effect once again of the subject's will. And so there I go into discourse, which I, there's not time to go into now. So I'll just go towards the end. Opening is outside, without cover, without shelter, without belonging in the sense of affiliation, without security, without guarantees. But the meanings of opening are not only negative. Opening means the other side of identity, the other side of interiority. It means demythization of the I, of identity, of its situation, its situation before enclosure in the abstract notions of freedom and non-freedom. The situation in which the I is not nailed down to, um, yes, again, to one's own being, to one's own identity, to one's own image. Preventive peace, liberation from the world of war, this opening, this beyond, its proximity to the other, is proximity to the other. The other, my neighbor, concerns me, is closer to me, a more urgent proximity, more pressing than the nearness, the closeness, the proximity of the being of things, of the world, a proximity closer than presence, a proximity even in the other's absence. Proximity to the other is responsibility for the other. Proximity means my responsibility that cannot be delegated, my uniqueness, my being unique, the only one for the other, my being support for the heavy charge of otherness, alterity. To speak does not only mean that we inevitably speak with the words of others, but also that we inevitably find ourselves in a relation of inescapable involvement and implication with the other. So, to speak is inevitably to respond, to answer, in the first place in the sense of having to respond to answer for oneself, of feeling and finding oneself responsible for the other, in the double sense of in the place of the other and for the sake of the other. The first case of the I, says Levinas, is not the nominative, the nominative but the accusative. In the face of the other, of the other's um, poverty, need, discomfort, hardship, the eye cannot but feel accused, under accusation, cannot but ask its own self, why am I being here, in this place, in this situation, in these advantageous conditions from which the other is excluded? This question can be followed up with a whole series of sorry, questions. Susan, yes. we're, we're out of time at this point. I've finished, I've finished. But the question remains, Victoria Welby would call this primary sense, mother sense, a sense that tells of involvement, unindifferent, help and support, participation, dedication, responsibility, in short, a situation where peace and to be at peace converges with love for the other and wanting that other's well-being, that other's happiness. Sorry for taking too much time, did I? Mm. <laughs> 
Thank you so much, Susan. And thank you everyone for your patience and your attention. Um, as Diane mentioned, we've actually hit the top of our third hour. So we've completed our time with you together um, and doesn't leave us time for questions. But what I'd like to say is that um, we've put in the chat um, websites and contact information for each of our speakers. And I want to invite you all to uh, watch the recording and perhaps use it as a talking point. And then uh, Jen, uh, did you, I'm gonna put Jen on for just a minute and then I'm, uh, we'll come back and wrap us up and say our goodbyes. So Jen. Oh yes, uh, thank you, Susan. And thank you everyone so much. I'm sorry we haven't had time to um, dis discuss any of this very brilliant uh, work that all of us have done. And maybe we could have another uh, question and answer uh, Zoom uh, salon next uh, Saturday, not this Saturday, but the coming Saturday. Would you all be available to, to come on and discuss? What date would that be? That would be de December the 3rd. Um, we have usually an open time. Um, so Jen is, is inviting us uh, to all converge again and have, uh, we'd meet in a different format. We'd actually come into a meeting room where everyone is actually present, a general meeting room. And um, I'll facilitate for anyone who wants to come and, hopefully by that time this uh, recording will be up. You can watch it again and you can bring your questions to that room. And if our speakers are available, I know it starts into the holidays, but we'll be present with you all. At least Jen and I will be there and anyone else who wants to. And we'll send that link out um, to the people who have registered in the thank you letter to you if you would like to join us. So that might give some uh, time for questions and answers. And um, I would just like to ask each of the, the speakers if they would like to say some, you know, just a sentence or a closing, and then I'll just uh, remind you of what will be happening next. So, um, Haida, thank you so much for coming. Would you like to say some closing words? I'm a little bit surprised now to say something at the end of these many um, and rich presentations. That's that could be fine. You could just say thank you and goodbye, but just so that you're you can say, we just want to thank you for being with us and whatever closing words you have to say is good. So that's plenty. Thank you so much, Haida. Uh, Mig Mahan, would you like to say some closing words? Just to thank everyone and thank you for the invitation. Forward to uh, hearing some feedback. Thank you again. Beautiful. Wonderful comments. Thank you so much. Darsha? Oh, I appreciate uh, everyone's uh, speech, talk, lecture, conversation, and uh, how we are addressing multiple levels of analysis and change. And I think uh, we all have something important to contribute. And I just wanted to reiterate, Letitia, your uh, emphasis on um, if you haven't received the evolved nest growing up, there are things you can do to uh, remedy that. And uh, so to not give up hope there, we can all uh, uh, learn new things and new ways of being and get back to that partnership and sense of connection with the planet, with our mother earth and with one another. Uh, so thank you very much. I'll see you a week from tomorrow then. Thank you, Darsha. Mary? Mary? Um, I would just like to reiterate the thank you for the invitation because every time Jen and others invite me, it brings it, um, it makes me have to think more deeply about the work I'm doing. And uh, I really appreciate that opportunity and, and thank you. Thank you so much, Mary. And Susan, thank you for joining us. Would you have some closing words you'd like to say? 
I'd just like to thank you all, and I agree with everything that everybody has said in their in their uh, greetings, in their goodbyes. And uh, I I would like to say simply that the world, well, you know, the world is a mess at the moment. Uh, things, the situation, I think, is tragic all over the globe. But having said that, there is hope, and we can work. I, I really think that it's not a, a utopia, utopic, to say that we can change things and we can create a better world and I think it's uh, cultures uh, from the past indigenous cultures that that have shown us this truth that we're not talking about something impossible that we can work together for a better world and we have to we must thank you so much Susan I want to also thank uh, Judith for your attention I know that you were looking at the chat and the Q&A, we didn't have an opportunity for questions, but you're with us. So pop out, show us and wave. Thank you so much for being here. Elena Skoko and Diane, who are our tech. Um, Elena is actually for the first time calling in from Australia of all places. So she's way down under. Elena, thank you for joining us. And Diane, always for your support in technology and making sure that we stay uh, connected. Our next salon. So next Saturday, which will be December the 3rd, we'll have an open discussion. And we will again, I'll, we'll send out the information. So if you have time and would like to attend, um, you are invited. So um, the only way we can do that is the people who actually registered, be prepared because Diane said over 100 people registered to actually come. So they were registering to get the information and the recording. So hopefully they'll be able to see the recording before they come to the discussion. On December the 17th, we'll be having a special salon on the gift of truth in war and peace with Medea Benjamin um, from uh, one of the co-founders of Code Pink, um, Karina Kylo from Finland and Paola Mel Melichori, who's from Italy. So the three of them will be speaking on December the 17th. So if you can't join us for the discussion group next weekend, please do join us on the 17th. The video will be, rep will be posted at the maternal gift economy movement.org. And we look forward to any of your feedback and comments please send them to maternalgifteconomy at gmail.com. I have been your moderator, Letitia Lason. So we hope to see you at either December the 3rd for a discussion or December the 17th for our 40th salon. And thank you so much for celebrating with us today for this opening of the third year of our presentations and discussions. So everyone, please be well, stay safe, be kind to one another, and we'll see you soon. Bye for now.